Uh, we have a, a superb panel moderated by somebody. Uh, I couldn't imagine a, a better moderator to moderate this panel. Uh, somebody who spent a great time, a deal of, deal of time in Afghanistan, reporting on everything from civilian casualties to uh, ghost schools. Um, Asmat Khan has won a Pulitzer. She's a professor at Columbia. She has been, she's a fellow at New America. She's also been a professor at Arizona State. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Asmat now to introduce the panel and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's wonderful to be here. And it's especially wonderful to be here with two of the scholars from the Afghanistan Observatory at New America. The Observatory Fellowship is a hub for at-risk Afghans in exile with a demonstrated commitment to peace building, good governance, and the defense of human rights. I, I'm really excited to introduce these two scholars who are going to be walking us through today where we are a year on from the Taliban takeover. The first scholar is Sumaya Tora. She's the founder and executive director of the Dosti Network, which aims to reduce inequities among Afghans by serving as a vehicle to provide, to provide financial and immigration support to marginalized Afghans. It's close to home for her. She started this project out of her own efforts to help those within her family without a path to migration and expanded it to those other vulnerable groups. Tora is Afghanistan's first Rhodes Scholar, and she holds a Master of Public Policy from the University of Oxford, where she's also pursuing a second Master's in International Human Rights Law. If you have a chance, uh, Samaya recently published just this over the weekend in The Intercept, a podcast called Telling Afghanistan Stories in Their Own Words, um, the accounts of those who have had to leave the country and, and what they've been through, and it's incredibly powerful. Our second scholar we're joined by today is Kayum Sarush. Kayum Sarush has worked with many of the most prestigious research organizations in Afghanistan before he immigrated to Ireland after the collapse. He worked for the Center of Civilians and Conflict, which is an organization at the forefront of preventing civilian casualties, Human Rights Watch, and the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, as well as the Afghanistan Analyst Network. And those of you who study the country have probably relied on many of their reports. And I would encourage any of those of you who are interested in what's happening right now in Afghanistan to read their reports. They're really just unlike anything else. So um, Sarush's project with the Afghanistan Observatory explores the political economy of the Afghan conflict. And, you know, both of these two panelists bring a wealth of expertise. They're individuals who have been studying different aspects of what has lo long been in the making that we're seeing unfold in Afghanistan today. And so I think a good place for us to start would actually be with you, Kayum, because I'd like to talk a little bit about the current governance model in Afghanistan. The Taliban came to power with claims that they would have a different model of governance, that they would be able to govern effectively, that they had grassroots support. Can you lay out sort of what the reality is in comparison with those claims and what the contemporary system of governance you're seeing today is? Um, thank you so much, Azam. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as far as your uh, question is concerned, I'm going to refer to one of the most important books that the Taliban uh, leadership put out, it's called Emirat and Systems, which is there they are describing the political system or the, um, you know, the, the, the Emirat, Islamic Emirates that they wish to have. Uh, the book is actually um, uh, written by an important uh, Taliban uh, high officials called Abdullah Hakim Haqqani, who is also the uh, head of the uh, Taliban High Court. Uh, and there he described that we have, uh, overall, there is two types of government. One is called um, the government whose main um, uh, obligation is to collect tax. And uh, then there is the government that's the main obligation or the main <clears throat> motto for them is to guide people. And uh, from there, he, he insists that the government that we are going to build or the Islamic government or the MR, M, Islamic Emirate that they are going to build is uh, uh, the, the government for guiding people whose main uh, way to is uh, governing, uh, guiding people, which, which they call the Dawlat al Hidayah. So, and from there, he, he's, he says that the, there are three elements for, uh, for that government. And one is 
the an Islamic um, uh, army, and the second is uh, implementation of the Islamic Sharia or the Islamic law or um, laws of the gods, and then the last is the independent um, uh, judiciary systems. Uh, from then, uh, from there, they they're actually we can see that they are uh, building a. Uh, government, which is the main motto, is not to provide public services for the Afghan government, for the Afghan people, and uh, therefore it's no surprise that in the last few last years the whole burden of providing service has been for the um, uh, international community. And in practice, what we really see is that the Af the, that the Taliban regime is actually what the scholars would call is a religiously justified uh, totalitarianism. Which is its main way to has been to, uh, you know, to control Afghan uh, people through all means, and they are uh, interfering in all aspects of social and in individual lives. And we also see a kind of dictatorship because that there is only one man rule who does not have a face even, and what he says at the you know at the top will be the law. And uh, for that, the sake of the, this type of government, for understanding that they, there is a whole chapter in that book uh, where they, they are saying that, uh, th that the whole chapter in rejection of all human-made laws, uh, which means they will only obey the laws that are based on Sharia and other laws will not be um, obeyed by the, that, the Taliban government. So, and that's why we, 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 we see lots of uh, violation of human rights, um, lots of uh, extra extrajudiciary killings, torturings, kidnappings of um, and as if the Afghan National uh, Defense Forces, the uh, other uprising forces that were uh, uh, fighting against the Taliban uh, uh, during the ex-governments. And also, uh, we, we what we see in their cabinet is actually all male, predominantly Pashtun, uh, ethnicities, uh, which many of them are actually in the list of uh, United Nations uh, sanctions, sanction list. So, right. uh, yeah. So um, it seems like, you know, many of the actions that the Taliban government had so criticized about the previous government, these extrajudicial killings, torture, kidnapping, a lot of this is occurring under their own rule. What kind of effect will that have or is that having on civil society, on, you know, their ability to govern? Do you see this, for example, descending into a civil war? Of course, that that's, uh, you know, we already see some uh, already uprising or resistance to the Taliban uh, regime. Uh, just yesterday, there was, uh, you know, the widespread report of uh, Killing the uh, th those in custody of uh, um, uh, resistance against them in in, in Panjshir, and uh, the same thing happened with all other uh, resistance or any kind of oppositions to the uh, Taliban regime, which include the civilian activist or woman activist who has been tortured uh, during their past years. So uh, we might not see any kind of, uh, you know, in, uh, big fighting or ag big res res resistance against them in any time soon. But the country is sliding slowly to that uh, shape if they did not change the law and their approach uh, and their, you know, uh, policies against um, their their opponents. Right, and this is obviously being exacerbated by the humanitarian crisis that's currently happening. Samaya, can you talk a little bit about what NGOs and others trying to do this kind of development are facing and also whether they're really able and the best posed to provide this kind of aid? Hi, Asma, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Uh, so I just turned off my video because I think my internet connection is not great. Sure. As long as everyone can hear me, I think I'll keep my camera off. If you don't mind just repeating the question um, quickly sure. because it yes. cut off. Right. So the governance, what the current situation in Afghanistan is exacerbated by the current humanitarian crisis. Some have called it the world's largest. How would you describe the issues that are facing NGOs and the sort of 
system of revenue within the government to administer its own aid? What are you seeing as the challenges there? Yes. So going back to what um, what Kayum highlighted, I think um, because of the fact, and this is the area that my organization I've been working on since September, um, because of the fact that the Afghan uh, the Taliban government is not capable of providing services, but also that's not the priority of the government, and the ideology is not based necessarily on they don't envision a government based on providing services to civilians. Even when you listen to um, some of the uh, the video uh, conversations where uh, Taliban leaders, specifically Haqqani, um, the the one of the interviews with Yalda Hakim on BBC with um, one of the members of the Haqqani network, um, he mentioned that when he was asked about the humanitarian crisis, um, the short response is usually that they believe that God would resolve that problem eventually. As a Muslim, I think, yes, as a person of faith, I believe that, but as, as a government, I don't think that's the response people expect from people, people people who are waiting to be served in some way. Um, and this incapability has been showcased in several instances when the earthquake happened in Paktika and Paktia regions. Um, there were people um, who needed humanitarian assistance and it was very, very difficult to get for a lot of these NGOs to access and provide services because of the fact that the government was not capable, the de facto government was not capable of creating systems that could um, deliver services quickly. Similarly, um, there have been instances of floods, drought, and there's the ongoing food uh, insecurity in the country. Um, there are um, people who are, um, there's almost about a 5 billion humanitarian aid request of aid in the history of UN. Um, and you can see that the, the level of crisis is, is at a level that the UN has not seen before. And that comes back to what Kayum mentioned is the incapability of the government the de facto government to provide services, but also to govern. Right. And Samaya, are you seeing this more exacerbated in particular regions of the country, particular places where there is less of this infrastructure or the Taliban is less able to, certainly it's, you know, had a, an incredible failure to provide services overall, but are there particular pockets and places where it's people are particularly vulnerable, where you're seeing that humanitarian catastrophe um, more severe? Yes. So, so mostly, so the areas that have been mostly affected are rural areas that have seen uh, natural disasters or the earthquake or the flooding. But now, at the moment, even in urban cities like Kabul, women outside, usually, time women and girls are begging on the street for a piece of bread, mm -hmm. and this was something that was being reported by several journalists have been featured. So the food insecurity is not necessarily just affecting rural parts of the country, but it is very much prevalent today in urban areas as well and in cities like Kabul, which used to be, which has a lot of infrastructure and which was sort of the hub of the, the progress that was brought by the U.S. Uh, government. Yeah, it, it's really jarring to see the images of people lining up for food um, in many of these places, people who have, you know, said to camera that they've never had to do this before, that this is a new experience for them. Um, and it's hard not to underestimate just the effects of what this kind of food insecurity, what this kind of economic decline will have over the long term. Um, but I want to shift gears to something that I think has recently garnered more attention because of the drone strike on El Zawahri in Kabul and Sharaina neighborhood, uh, an area where many did not expect him, you know, Al Qaeda's leader to be, um, where many did not expect that the United States would be carrying out or continue to carry out drone strikes in the area. And I, I want to turn to you, Kayum, to, to give a little bit of context to this in terms of the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and what we're hearing or what we're learning about 
how familiar they were with this and what they might even allow. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, uh, quite uh, surprisingly, uh, just yesterday, uh, Al Qaeda published a um, report and saying in their uh, you know magazines with the huge pictures of Malomar on the cover saying that they will not um, attack United States from Afghanistan anymore, which is quite surprising considering that uh, uh, they still say that we will attack from somewhere else, but not from Afghanistan, considering that their leader has been killed in uh, in, in Kabul and Shara now under the Taliban watch. And um, and quite surprising as well that they have not admitted yet that they, uh, Imran al-Zawahiri has been killed in Kabul. Uh, because probably they are waiting for the Taliban to confirm it first, and then because the Taliban said that they're going to investigate the incidents, which is taking for like weeks, uh, uh, and then after that they want to uh, issue their uh, uh, you know f- officials' uh, reactions to that. But uh, as long as the, the relation has is, con- is concerned, we know that uh, at least part of Taliban and especially Haqqani networks had a very strong relations with Al Qaeda in the past, and they have built, you know, not only uh, through, through Islamist groups but also interlink and through families, marriage, and uh, strong relations between their families when they were in, back in Pakistan and also in Afghanistan, and uh, especially Haqqani networks. And the, the, the house that the uh, Imam Zawahiri was called is actually belonged to an aide of Sirajuddin Haqqani, who is the uh, acting uh, interior minister for the Taliban. So um, it is not simple for them to break up the, tol- the relationship they have been developing with Al Qaeda for for years now, and uh, we know that the both groups have been uh, benefiting for such uh, from such uh, relationship, and also uh, uh, considering that the the Taliban uh, is was uh, blaming that uh, the United States for uh, you know uh, breaking the Doha agreement. It's quite clear in the Doha agreement that the, the Taliban will not harbor any uh, terrorist groups recognized by the United States. Uh, so f- for me, it's uh, it's quite tough time for the Taliban to decide whether to acknowledge the killing of Imam Zawahiri and then clean up some internal disputes uh, over who uh, were uh, did, you know uh, pr- uh, protected and you know invited the the um, uh, Imran al al-Qaeda leader in in Kabul but they're gonna have a strong relationship for uh, for for time maybe they, 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 that midnight come now come in public as um, uh, as I mentioned because al-Qaeda announcing that they will not uh, uh, you know, attack United States from Afghanistan. But it's a complex, um, long-term uh, relationship that they have, and it will be uh, as strong as it was in the past. <clears throat> so what is the likelihood? So if if each side is being accused of having broken this agreement, the Doha agreement, what are the potential repercussions? What kind of fallout could we see from this? Well, um, that, that would be really interesting to see, but from... Uh, 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 you know, what we see and what happened in Afghanistan, actually, uh, the Taliban takeover of the, the Afghanistan, what other analysts have been always saying is, based on the Doha agreements that provided the way for the Taliban to come and take over the Kabul, because that actually break the resistance within the Republic. And then after even everyone could see that the uh, that the United States, is, you know, has uh, decided to leave the Afghanistan and the Taliban just could outweigh the, the 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 deadlines that the United States was providing, and the Doha agreement was the only legal, let's say, uh, uh, document that could provide such uh, you know relationship between the Taliban and the United States. If such uh, agreement is not observed anymore, the then the uh, uh, of course the United States has all the options on the table, including drone attacks that's now happening across Afghanistan. We don't know if that's the whole target, the, 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 you know, the, as uh, Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups, or that also include Taliban leadership, which uh, just after the drone attacks in Shara now, uh, the leaders of the Haqqani networks, uh, especially Sarajin Haqqali, disappeared for, for days and uh, uh, did not come to public probably the fearing that there about me drone attacks. And the same thing will, 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 will be the Taliban, uh, that they promised to not attack the 
uh, at Taliban, uh, United States interests from Afghanistan or do not harbor terrorists in Afghanistan. So if such document is not observed, then the, the, both parties will have their whole, the all options on the table to decide what kind of relationship or what how they want to deal with each other. And that could mean also full-scale uh, warfare that we had in the past 20 years. Right. And I think it's hard not to talk about this relationship between the United States and Afghanistan and not also talk about, you know, what America has really wanted from the Afghan government with respect to human rights issues, with respect to the education of women and girls. And so I want to shift the focus there and, and talk to you, Samaya, a little bit about what we're seeing, not just the promises that the Taliban did not keep about allowing um, all girls back into schools, basically rejecting them on the day of when they were expecting to be able to attend. Can you tell us a little bit about how women and girls have been affected and specifically their rationale for why they have doubled down on some of these rejections of girls from getting into school? Yes. Um so a document that I would encourage everyone to read would be the Special Rapporteur of Afghanistan's uh, report, his first report that was presented to the Human Rights Council yesterday at the 51st session. Um, so that outlines uh, the human rights violations that are currently occurring in Afghanistan and also um, actually points out that women specifically are at the forefront of being marginalized and are being erased by within the society, Afghan society. Um, and the most important issue being girls' education. Um, so we know that it's been almost a year girls are banned from going to secondary schools uh, in almost uh, in 24 provinces out of 30, 34. Um, so most girls cannot attend secondary schools, although there were efforts in some provinces such as Paktia where girls um, tried to reopen schools. Um, this after after a week, the schools were actually shut by the Taliban. It's recently. Um, and some of these girls were detained. Um, some of them were actually shot on. Um, so it's it it this the situation for specifically for young girls and women is it very 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 critical in Afghanistan. Um, about eighty four percent of women have lost their jobs. Um, but uh, in addition to women, I think it's important to mention ethnic minorities and that dimension. Um, some some of the ethnic minorities, such as Hazaras, um, Turkmans, Uzbeks, have been forcefully displaced. We have seen almost 13 attacks by claimed by ISIS, some of which have been claimed by ISIS-K towards the Hazara community during Ashura, which is a uh, very important religious uh, time for Shia Muslims in Afghanistan. Um, and the, the these are issues that we're seeing currently in the country and going back to education i would say that um it goes back to something kayum has raised about the the political tension within the different groups of taliban that are the haqqanis and kandaharis and the disagreement on reopening of school is also because of the different viewpoints that are held by different taliban members at different levels um, so there are few conservative leaders that have been uh, pushing for, have pushed for not reopening schools. Um, and that includes the, the prime minister and the deputy prime minister, uh, all, who, those of whom that have very conservative viewpoints on reopening of schools. Uh, while there are some factions within the Taliban that agree that schools should be reopened, um, but it's been almost a year and it has not. So, um, yeah. Is, do they stand to lose? Does the Taliban stand to lose, you know, in its fight against the Islamic State affiliate in Afghanistan? Is that part of the reason why they're doubling down so hard on education is that there is a sort of war over culture happening right now 
And there's the possibility that you know, they may further lose ground, lose recruits to this opposing side. How much of that does play a role in some of their thinking? Because I think it's important to get into like why they are so adamant about this, because they would stand to gain so much, right, by allowing girls into secondary schools. There have been cuts on funding, like it seems entirely in their interest. Um, Kayum or Samaya, can you get into what their logic might be and why they might be rejecting this so forcefully? Yeah, so I, 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 for for a year, I think there has been a huge debate on this, and people have tried to rationalize how the if this is like there's a political motive, or it, it, is it because of sanctions that they're doing? Uh, uh, after a year and working on this with several organizations, I can say that it has to do with their attitude and the fact that they do see women as really like second class citizens and. For them, it is that perspective. Some of the leaders do hold that. And so they are, in a way, uh, yeah, it is the outright marginalization of women uh, that's ongoing in the country. So I wouldn't want to rationalize it in a political sense. Um, but I think one thing important is that uh, because of ISIS-K, the Taliban are focusing a lot of their spending on security. So that's another reason why they might not be able to fund or get uh, female teachers or get enough funding for education. And that could also make um, girls' education and making schools, um, because the gender segregation is very important for reopenings of schools, um, that might make it an obstacle. Because if they don't have enough funding to hire female teachers, how are they going to reopen schools? But I, I think that goes along with the mentality of some of the Taliban members who are very conservative and actually don't want girls to go back to school. So there is an element of um, not being able to provide that service because of the, the insecurities that they face by ISIS-K. But at the same time, there is an attitude towards thinking that education for girls is not important. Okay. Um, so I think that we are hitting close to the end of time. So if there are any questions um, uh, or there's anything else that anyone would like to add from among the speakers, what if you had to leave the viewers here with one sort of, um, you know, guide to what they should know about what's happening in Afghanistan right now, briefly, what, what would you tell them? Uh, can I go first? Um, I, I, I think what we can say that the Taliban is building uh, probably a worse model of uh, Islamic regime that we have in Iran, a total totalitarian dictatorship regime, which is also uh, censoring lots of uh, media outlets. And that's why you don't have, uh, you, you have lots of problem getting information when this incident such as uh, important as it, as killing of uh, Imran Zawahiri in Kabul happens, and lots of other incidents that now happening in Kabul goes or uh, across Afghanistan goes underreported. So um, we we uh, the, the international community and the uh, uh, United States and other uh, you know international actors involved in Afghanistan should be uh, you know uh, careful of and watch out because the Taliban will not be okay. you know content Wait. in Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Kayum. Thank you, Samaya. Both of you have been incredible. I really appreciate the time you took. And please look out there for their work through the Afghanistan Observatory Fellowship. Samaya, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut it short there um, just because we're running low on time. But thank you both so much. I appreciate it.